Good morning. My name is Tom Press, and uh, to continue in our book, Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy, our study of the Jesuit order and the Roman Catholic cult and how they control our government. And this is a very revealing book. I hope you can find a copy of this book, Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy. Educate yourself. Get a copy of this book and uh, read it and share it with friends. We're going to pick up, uh, back up about a paragraph from where we left off yesterday for continuity purposes. The author writes, and now we're talking about the Council of Trent, uh, the first ecumenical council called after the establishment of the Jesuit order. The Jesuit order, together with the Council of Trent, comprise what we know today as the Counter-Reformation. Jesuitism was created to extirpate or to annihilate heretics from off the earth, Protestants particularly, named so even in their oath. And the Council of Trent, as we will see in the reading today, was called primarily to denounce the doctrines and beliefs and teachings of the Protestant Reformation and to damn heretics uh, to be extirpated or annihilated from off the earth. Now, it begins here, most of the 18-year life of the Council of Trent, and went on for 18 years, most of the 18-year lifetime of the Council of Trent consisted of two intermissions spanning four and ten years each. At the beginning of the second intermission, Ignatius founded a special college in Rome for German-speaking Jesuits called Germanicum. Three years later, the Peace of Augsburg established the principle of whose the region, his the religion. The Peace of Augsburg was Jesuit pay dirt. They could now bring whole populations to Rome simply by winning over a few princes, and so they did. By 1560, the society had returned virtually all all of southern, uh, southern Germany and Austria to the Roman Catholic Church. So the Peace of Augsburg was a Protestant attempt to maintain their spiritual sovereignty. And the principle of who's the region, his the religion. So it became the object of both, obviously, Protestants and Catholics to get control of the regions, so thereby to to establish their religion in that particular region. So it became a turf war. And... The Jesuits just love that type of thing because they are above and beyond all else. Political masterminds. Political um, infiltrators and usurpers. And so they literally took control, as they always do, of the hierarchy of those regions in order to establish... Catholicism, everywhere. It says the fruits of the Germanicum were so successful that when the Council of Trent finally adjourned in December 4th, 1563, its decrees and canons conceded nothing to the Protestant reformers. Indeed, under the spiritual direction of Superior General Diego Lainez, the Jesuit General Lainez, And, by the way, Ignatius uh, Loyola had died in 1556 before the conclusion of the Council of Trent. It said the Council denied every Protestant doctrine point by point. So now it becomes perfectly obvious what the Council of Trent was about, to denounce every aspect of the Protestant Reformation. He continues, he says, anathematized, which means eternally damned, was anyone who believed that salvation is God's free gift to his faithful and does not depend upon partaking of the Roman Catholic Church sacraments. 
anathema, anathematized or eternally damned was anyone who looked to the Bible for the ultimate authority on doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, rather than to the Roman Catholic Church, the teaching church, he calls it here. Anathematized or eternally damned was anyone who regarded as unworthy of belief such unscriptural doctrines as, number one, the efficacy of papal indulgences. Remember, this is what Martin Luther and so many of the other reformers protested against, was simony, which Rome cleverly calls indulgences, so as to distract the mind from what they really were. Simoniacal um, favors or forgiveness of sin for money in exchange for money. That's what indulgences are. And it eternally damns anyone, the Council of Trent eternally damned anyone who denied the efficacy, the effectuality of papal indulgences or simony. Number two, of confession alone to a priest as necessary for salvation. Now, the Protestant reformers realized when they got their own Bible that we have a great high priest and confessor who sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. And we are to confess our sins. And if we confess our sins, He, Christ, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So all of a sudden, the, the Protestants realized they had but one priest. And anyone else calling himself a priest on the earth was a blasphemer. Not only that, but Man does not confess his sins to another sinful man. But these priests didn't accept that they were sinful men, but alter Christos, other Christs, with the same authority to forgive and to bind sins as Christ. And it was another form of blasphemy committed by the priesthood of the Roman Catholic cult. And they threw off that yoke. And they said, salvation is by grace through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works or confession to a priest that any man should boast. But the Roman Catholic cult damns, eternally damns those who will not confess their sins to a Roman Catholic priest. Number three, of the Mass as a true and real sacrifice of the body of Christ necessary to salvation. That is, if you deny that the consecrated wafer is the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ, the whole Christ, to be offered again, as another sacrifice for the remission of sins, then you are to be eternally damned. In other words, if, you're, if you claim faith in the one-time shedding of Christ's blood as the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world at Calvary, and that is the only sacrifice, the last sacrifice, never to be repeated again, and that one sacrifice is wholly efficacious, redeeming, then you are to be eternally damned. Number four, if you deny the legitimacy of teachings on purgatory, which is never mentioned in the Bible, never even implied in the Bible, to be absent with the Lord, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, not purgatory. Either Christ purges your sins, or your sins are bound. Your sins are either loosed in Christ, or they are bound in unforgiveness. And there's no place to purge unforgiven sin but the throne of Christ. 
But Rome says if you deny purgatory, then you are eternally damned. Number five, the celibate priesthood. If you deny the celibate priesthood, you are eternally damned. Now remember, celibacy relates to marriage, not to sexual purity. Sexual purity is referred to as chastity. There is no chastity in the Roman Catholic priesthood. As a matter of fact, they are sexually debauched. They have sex with each other. They have sex with the little boys. And the sexual improprieties of the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church is legion. And it is ever since its founding. It's well documented. It can't be denied even by those who hold fast to this Roman Catholic cult. Number six, invoking... Oh, and by the way, before I leave the subject of celibacy, celibacy forbids a priest to marry, and that was done to protect the assets of the church. So Rome doesn't even trust its own priests, thinking that possibly the priest could pilfer uh, money, assets from the church and give to their families and wives. So that's why there's celibacy. There's no heirs, no children, no legitimate children that could be heirs of church-stolen property. <clears throat> Number six, you are to be eternally damned if you do not believe that you can invoke the saints by prayer to intercede with God. The Bible forbids necromancy, praying to the dead. But Rome says, no, you must invoke the saints by prayer to intercede with God. Number seven, the veneration of relics. You are eternally damned if you do not believe in the veneration of relics, as does the Roman Catholic cult. But the Bible commands us not to be idolaters, not to worship objects or hold them sacred. Not so in the Roman Catholic cult. Number eight, the, you are to be eternally damned if you do not believe in the use of images and symbols. But God forbid idolatry. Paul reiterated God's law of idolatry and making images and idols. He said, Brethren, keep you from idols. For one to look upon an image or an idol as some sort of intercessor or to remind you of things in heaven or in earth to pray to, you've corrupted your own concept of the invisible and glorified Lord of glory whom no one has seen and lived. You've destroyed a right concept of him. A concept that can only be right if it is obtained from the scriptures by knowing him. But no one is allowed to see him. Not in his glorified form. The Council of Trent hurled 125 anathemas or damnations, eternal damnations, against Protestantism. 125 curses, eternal damnations against Protestantism. There, if there's one thing in the world that the Roman Catholic Church is expert in, that is cursing. And we're only talking about Protestantism and only one council of the Roman Catholic cult, that of the Council of Trent. And in that council, which can be read, still published today, the Council of Trent, there are 125 individual damnations and curses against Protestantism. He says then, as an addendum, as if it needed one, an addendum to its closing comments, the council recommended that the Jesuits should be given pride of place over members of other orders as preachers and professors. Now, let me tell you, 
This is talking about the Jesuits having precedence and power and control over the other ecclesiastical orders, monks and nuns, the Franciscans, the, the, uh, the Dominicans. And there's a secret hatred, and I even witnessed it one day while researching and watching the uh, Roman Catholic Channel. There was a Jesuit priest who's named Mitch something or other. Uh, his last name escapes me. It doesn't matter. Jesuit is a Jesuit. And he was addressing uh, an audience, and there in the front sat a Dominican, a Dominican monk, a Dominican priest. And the camera, hap the Jesuit priest happened to uh, introduce him. And, of course, the camera panned toward this Dominican priest who had a noticeable scowl on his face. <laughs> it was rather comical. And uh, it was so obvious to the camera that this Jesuit priest even acknowledged that uh, there were some differences between the Jesuits and the Dominicans, but he wouldn't go into it right now. But this happened at the Council of Trent. The Franciscans, the Dominicans, and all the so-called holy orders of the Roman Catholic Church were now required to kowtow and to bow down to these all-powerful and all-important uh, Jesuit priests. Excuse me. So the Council of Trent hurled 125 anathemas or eternal damnations against Protestantism. Then, as an addendum to the closing statements, the Council recommended the Jesuits should be the pride and place should be given pride and place over members of other orders as preachers and professors. And it was at Trent that the Roman Catholic Church began marching to the beat of the Black Papacy. That's right. The Roman Catholic Church began to respond to the black pope. This is where, this is the time right after the creation of the Jesuit order that the, that the black papacy began to assert its power and influence in the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, when, when you gain the ascendancy over these other orders of priesthood, Pretty soon it becomes apparent to the rest of the church that the Jesuits rule the roost. And so the church responded. And it says, A generation later, the guidelines of the Roman Inquisition under Jesuit direction were published at the command of the Cardinal's Inquisitor General. Now this is huge. The, 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 the other orders, I believe it was the Dominicans, previously had responsibility of the Inquisition. They were the ones who brought in heretics to be tried and burned. They were the ones who con uh, confiscated their, 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 their wealth, their belongings, their property. They were the recipients of the booty when heretics were extirpated. Now... That goes to the Jesuits, and you're beginning to understand why there was a noticeable scowl on the face of that Dominican priest when, uh, quote-unquote, Father <clears throat> Mitch Pacwa introduced that Dominican priest. They just don't like one another, actually. The Jesuits don't care because they, they're they all-powerful, but the Dominican, you know, the Jesuit wore a smile on his face. Mitch Pacwa was... Uh, you know, obviously amused by the scowl on the face of this Dominican. You know, we need to learn how to exploit that natural hatred that the Dem that the Dominicans have for the for the uh, for the Jesuit priests. You know, if you want to see an internal implosion in the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, just pit all the uh, the uh, the Dominicans and the Franciscans against the Jesuits and watch it implode. God might have a little hand in that later on. We'll have to see what happens. Anyway, a generation later, the guidelines of the Roman Inquisition under Jesuit direction was published at the command of Cardinal of the Cardinal's Inquisitor General. 
This Directorium Inquisitorum of 1584 was dedicated to Gregory the Thirteenth, the Pope who bestowed upon the Jesuits the right to deal in commerce. That's right, a holy order uh, dealing in commerce and banking, and all, and who also decreed that every papal legate should have a Jesuit advisor on his personal staff. Can you imagine this? Now they're required to have a Jesuit advisor on their staff. They're going to control even the internal business of, of uh, the papal legates. And the Jesuits have the right to deal in commerce and banking. Now that seems strange only to the people who haven't done re any research in this. The Jesuits control the vast wealth of the Roman Catholic Church. The Jesuits are in control of the, the Roman Catholic Church. The Jesuits are in control of our Federal Reserve System, as we'll discover even later on in this book. Okay, so the wealth, power, and influence, the coercive power of the Jesuits is beyond most people's comprehension. And... Uh, so now we even have papal legates that uh, are required to have a Jesuit on their advisory committees. And it says, here follows a summary of the Directorum Inquisitorum. Translated by J.P. Gallagher of 1838, he says, He is a heretic who does not believe what the Roman hierarchy teaches. A heretic merits the pains of fire. By the gospel, the canons, civil law, civil law, and customs, heretics must be burned. For the suspicion alone of heresy, purgation is demanded. In other words, your extirpation is demanded. You must be purged from society on the mere suspicion of heresy. Magistrates who refuse to take the oath for the, for the defense of the Roman Catholic Church shall be suspected of heresy. Magistrates. Secular magistrates, judges, who refuse to take the oath for the defense of the, of the Roman Catholic faith shall be suspected of heresy. Wars may be commenced by the authority of the church. Wars may be commenced by the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. She doesn't call herself the church militant for no reason. And the wars are called by the Vatican. And nations respond to her battle call. So does the United States of America. We don't go to war unless the, the Pope requires it. And I know that sounds outrageous to people who haven't done the research, but keep listening to Inquisition Update and stay tuned for the break. And we'll continue this discussion in just a few moments. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, 
we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crossTheBorder.org. Now we're continuing with this. The, the tenets of the Directorium Inquisitorum uh, instituted by the Jesuit generals. He is a heretic who does not believe what the Roman hierarchy teaches. A heretic merits the pains of fire. By the gospel, the canons, civil law, and customs, heretics must be burned. For the suspicion alone of heresy, purgation is demanded. Magistrates who refuse to take the oath for defense of the faith shall be suspected of heresy. Wars may be commenced by the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Now let me give you some dimension to this particular tenet. The, the Roman Catholic Church fomented the destruction of the czars of Russia who protected the Eastern Orthodox Church that rebelled against the Roman Catholic Church and split off. They were the, 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 the Eastern Orthodox Churches are a product of the first great schism. I refer to it as the first great schism of the Roman Catholic Church. It was the first 
Well, you couldn't hardly call it a reformation, but it had the same effect on Rome. It divided the sheep. You know, all of a sudden, the Eastern Orthodox Church became a sheep stealer, a threat. It diminished Rome's influence and power and her assets, her ability to bilk, bilk the people of indulgences and relics and treasure. Not just power and influence, but, you know, what Rome lives on, gold and silver and precious stones and pearls. So, Rome waged war against these Eastern Orthodox Church by destroying the governments that protected the Eastern Orthodox Church, which were the czars of Russia. And when Rome got control of the government, then the purgation of the Eastern Orthodox heretics began. And along with that, persecution of the Jews. That was uh, led up to the First World War. And who suffered besides the Orthodox and Jews of Russia? The Orthodox and Jews of Europe. And this time Protestantism was added. Germany was punished. Protestant Germany. That area of the land that produced the likes of heretic Martin Luther and his 95 theses. Yes, indeed. Protestantism was the target of World War I and World War II. Again, it was Protestant Germany. The Roman Catholic Church raised up Hitler. And even in his own land, he, ra he waged war against Protestantism through the help of the American government. Now, I know that's not a version of history that you've ever heard before, unless you're a regular listener to Inquisition Update and the Investigative Journal and uh, Eric John Phelps' Biblical Truth and History and Prophecy, and to a large degree, even Nicholas Arthur across the border. Protestantism was the target of these wars. And to think that Rome won't do that here in the United States defies common sense. No one in this country has the right, in view of history, to deny that Rome wouldn't do the same thing right here in this country. And I'm saying that's precisely what's going to happen in this country. The odds are much in favor. In other words, it's virtual certainty that Rome, if she gains the, the power and influence and control that I say she has in this country, me and so many other researchers into this subject, it's a virtual certainty that Judaism, Orthodoxy, and Protestantism is going to be purged from this land, claimed by Christopher Columbus under the auspices of Spanish Ferdinand and Isabella under the ultimate authority of the Pope of Rome. And here they've opened the border with French Catholic Canada and Spanish Catholic Mexico. And we've got a, a, the last bastion of Protestantism existing between the two. And nobody can figure out why the government uh, wants a North American Union. Well, it's because Rome controls the government. And they're ready to, to squash Protestantism and Orthodoxy and, and Judaism and anybody else that won't take the Mass or worship Mary and relics and won't obey the teachings of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church and who say salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. Rome's never going to change, not until Christ comes. And it's... Anyone who thinks that this is not going to happen in this country is in denial. And we're seeing it happen right before our very eyes. Sooner or later, the light has to click on. And that's why this program is called Inquisition Update. To bring the light on. 
Now, continuing with the tenets of this Directorium Inquisitorum, it says, Indulgences for the remission of sins belong to those who signed with the cross before the persecution uh, for the persecution of heretics. That's right. You gain an indulgence from the Pope if you sign on with the cross for the persecution of Protestants, Orthodox, and Jews. You've bought your salvation if you kill a heretic or an Orthodox or a Jew. It says every individual may kill a heretic. Every individual may kill a heretic. Persons who betray heretics shall be rewarded. There's your indulgence. Ecclesiastical favor if you rat out a heretic. That means you won't be able to trust your own family. Because Rome has a history of saying, give up the heretics. If you don't, you'll be suspected of a heretic and you will suffer the death of a heretic. And those who seek to save their own lives will give up the heretics, and it might be your own mother. Now you say, in time, you're being too rough. No, I'm being realistic. I'm being historically accurate. Persons who betray heretics shall be rewarded. Heretics must be forced to profess the Roman faith. Heretics must be forced to profess the Roman faith. Now, that's what we saw in the Inquisition. You were tied to a stake. The faggots were piled up around you. A man, an inquisitor, stood there with a torch. And a priest came to you with the consecrated wafer, the Eucharist, and says... Is this the body of Christ? And if the heretic said, no, it's just a piece of bread, they lit the faggots. You're going to be forced to be Roman Catholic in this country, or you will pay with your life. And to say that that's not going to happen in this country is not rational belief based on history or the Bible. It says, a heretic, as he sins in all places, may everywhere be judged. In other words, if you're a heretic, you're a walking sin. So you sin everywhere you go because you're a heretic. And since you are a heretic everywhere you go, everywhere you may be judged and exterminated. There's no refuge. For a heretic anywhere in the world, anywhere in the, in the world that Rome controls, a heretic has no refuge. Heretics must be sought after and be corrected or exterminated. That's right. Our own government is going to seek us out and offer us correction as a charitable outward sign they're going to put you in a concentration camp, a reorientation center, they may call it. And you'll be given opportunities to recant and to, you know, disclaim your heresy and accept Roman Catholicism. If not, you will be exterminated, and in most cases, even if you do accept Roman Catholicism, you'll be exterminated, as has seen so many cases throughout history. Once a heretic converts to Roman Catholicism, in fear that when, when released from custody, that he'll recant his confession of Catholicism, they just kill him as soon as they baptize him. As soon as the Roman Catholic Church baptizes a heretic, your life isn't worth the breath you breathe. That's the historical truth. That's not bigotry. That's not hate speech. 
That's historically documented truth, and we saw it as recently as in the nineteen uh, the the the, the uh, nineteen forty seven in Croatia, nineteen forty five in Croatia. The Orthodox of uh, Yugoslavia and and uh, Croatia were given an opportunity to confess the Catholic faith and be baptized. And as soon as they did, they mowed them down with machine guns, lest they recant. Nothing's changed. It says, heretics enjoy no privileges in law or equity. Now, I'll just give you one example. Tony Alamo Christian Ministries. Anybody who looked carefully at that at, the, at that uh, case realizes that Tony Alamo Christian Ministries and the parents weren't even allowed to defend themselves. They were given attorneys that were friendly to the court and literally led them to slaughter. Their children and their property are were, the children were taken and they're in the process of taking the property now. They're going to be left with the clothes on their back. They're going to be fugitives because they've been declared heretics. They'd been demonized in the in the Jesuit controlled press and they didn't have any equity or privilege in law or any consideration whatsoever. They were guilty as charged the moment the proceedings began. And it says the goods of heretics are to be considered as confiscated from the, perp- uh, from the perpetration of the crime. In other words, all the way back, if Rome wants to say you're a heretic, they'll go back in history as far as they want, declare you a, his- uh, a, a heretic post-dated, and confiscate all, the pro- all your property to that point. Okay, the goods of heretics are to be considered as confiscated from the the date of the uh, perpetration of whatever crime they're charged with. It says the Pope can enact new articles of faith. Yeah, he claims to be God, see? He can enact anything he wants. Anyway, whether it be faith or morals or civil government or anything. He can do what God can't do. He can change his mind. He can change his law. Definitions of popes and councils are to be received as infallible. Now, this infallibility that we talk about of the popes that... uh, became official doctrine in 1870, official dogma of the Roman Catholic Church in 1870, was tacitly understood even before the Council of Trent. Infallibility belongs to the Creator. Full stop. But the Pope claims infallibility. Continues, it says, Inquisitors may torture witnesses to obtain the truth. That's right. That's why our government is torturing prisoners. Rome's in control. Something that would have been unheard of or strikingly obnoxious to the American people is now accepted as routine by our government. Torture of witnesses. torture of our enemy. We used to be, or at least we thought we were a godly nation. We wouldn't torture a a prisoner, but now we do. And it it raises a little controversy, but not too much. And at least when it's discussed, it's never discussed in terms of the Inquisition or Protestantism versus Catholicism. God's righteousness versus that of the papacy. It's never couched in those terms. It's never even perceived in those terms. It, it's perceived in, in terms of policy or what's best for the nation, uh, the national security. The religious aspect of torture never comes into it. It's never entered into the discussion. 
He says it is laudable to torture those of every class who are guilty of heresy. In other words, uh, the Pope, when it comes to torture, is no respecter of persons. He can torture a king or a street sweeper. Doesn't matter. In that, he's true. God is no respecter of persons. Not so with the papacy, except in in uh, torture. The Pope has power over infidels, as he has demonstrated for nigh on to 2,000 years. The Church may make war with infidels. We've already covered that. It's about to happen right here in this country. Nobody believes me, at least not on amateur radio. I'm glad I have a few more wise people listening to me on Inquisition Update. He says, he who does not inform against heretics shall be deemed as suspected. We've already covered that. Inquisitors may allow heretics to witness against heretics, but not for them. That was typical of the inquisitors. If any heretic was allowed to testify, he had to testify against another heretic, certainly not to defend him. Inquisitors must not publish the names of informers, witnesses, and accusers. Yes, we protect the guilty in the Roman world. We protect their identity. And it says penitent heretics may be condemned to perpetual imprisonment. There's your life imprisonment. But only if you're a penitent heretic. Inquisitors may provide for their own expenditures and the salaries of their officers from the property of heretics. There's your confiscation of property. That's how they pay themselves for their efforts. There's no hindrance to the persecution of heretics. It's a money-making racket. And that's why Rome is so in, inconceivably wealthy. I listen to people when I tell them about uh, the uh, pedophile priest pandemic in the world and the monies that are paid out and damages to those who are uh, proven to be victims of priest pedophilia. And they and they say, well, they're going to break the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, look at the money they're putting out. I mean, uh, they they the, the Roman Catholic Church must be paupers. <laughs> no. No, they're not paupers. Especially if you understand the time value of money. They've been confiscating the property of heretics for nigh on to 2,000 years. And that wealth is well invested in a, in a banking and financial world system that is controlled by the Vatican. And they own the cattle on 10,000 hills, trust me. And the, what little payout they pay out for these uh, pedophile priests is just a pittance. And here we have dioceses uh, claiming bankruptcy. You know, they each they each are corporations. You know, you can't get to the mother church. You might take out you might take out a small diocese or something and put them in financial straits. But that's only to protect the assets of the church, which are incalculable. It says, inquisitors enjoy the benefits of a plenary indulgence, that is, full papal forgiveness of sins at all times in life and even in death. So there's a long line uh, when they start hiring inquisitors because you're guaranteed eternal life. A plenary indulgence is a complete and total lifelong pardon for sin by the Pope. You can't die in your sins because you have plenary indulgence. Whatever sin you commit in your life is forgiven ahead of time. And you can plot and scheme... You can go out and round up as many heretics as you want, knowing you're going to falsely accuse, you're going to falsely crucify and condemn and burn and waste and boil and flay and bury alive. Infamous heretics rip up the stomachs of the, of the wombs of their women 
and bash their, their babies' heads against the walls, and you're going to heaven. Not only that, you get to take their booty, a third of it. I mean, you can't get a better job in this life than to be an inquisitor for the Roman Catholic Church. Do you think anybody, when Rome lays down the gauntlet here in heretic Protestant America, do you think anybody's going to show one stitch of mercy? And especially when they make food scarce, when they make jobs scarce, when they make freedom scarce, when they make justice scarce, when they make hope scarce, do you think anybody, even your own mother, is going to have pity if you're a heretic? We're going to see the dark days of the Inquisition right here in this country. And hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, particularly not the woman who rides the scarlet-colored beast of Revelation chapter 17, who's decked in gold and silver and precious stones and pearls confiscated from 2,000 years of heretics. She loves her wealth, and she loves the wealth of heresies, heretics even more. And we're headed for a time of persecution in this country that we can't even conceive of. Because we've lived in comfort and plenty for so long that we think it's normal. When history shows us that Rome loves it the other way around. And for 1,500 years, that's the way it was. Two classes, the rich ruling elite, the priesthood, and those in service to the Roman Catholic Church, and the paupers and the persecuted. We're returning to those dark days. And the Inquisition is coming to Protestant America. That's wrapping it up for the week. We'll talk about this more Monday. Stay tuned for Nicholas Arthur and Cross the Border. The book of Revelation says... The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today. So you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it. Nations have fought for it. It has been traded. It has been borrowed. It has been purchased. It has been stolen. There's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.